But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Mark 10, 6 Greetings, mortals. I'm your host, Simon. Welcome back to the Library of Gnosis. Get a good deal on NordVPN. Link in the description. Okay, it is finally time to get into the squaring of the circle. And I'm also going to reveal who I think Jesus is. To better fully understand this broadcast, I'd advise you to go watch my video on Saturn and Metatron. I'll put a card up top. Now, kick back, relax, and grab your favorite drink, because this is going to be a long one. Squaring the circle is a problem that has existed since ancient times. It is the challenge of constructing a square with the same area as a given circle by using only a finite number of steps with compass and straight edge. In 1882, the task was proven to be impossible as a consequence of the lindenmann weistrass theorem, which proves that pi is a transcendental number that is infinite, which makes squaring the circle logically impossible. It is a paradox. It refers to the infinite nature of God, the creator that creates itself. It is doing the impossible. This also represents Jesus as being fully man and fully God, coming down from heaven, the circle, to earth, the square. First line of the Bible, Genesis 1, is literally also squaring the circle. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning God created the circle and the square. The square and compass in Freemasonry also represents the squaring of the circle. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. Isaiah 40:11. In the Bible Jesus is often described as a good shepherd leading his flock. Hermes was also known as the god of shepherds. Here is a bust of Hermes carrying a lamb on his back. And here is a very similar motif depicting Jesus also carrying a lamb in the exact same manner as his Greek cousin. Numerous depictions of Hermes as a shepherd god carrying a lamb on his shoulders. Hermes Kriopouros have been found throughout the Mediterranean world. And it is possible that the iconography of Hermes as the good shepherd had an influence on early Christianity, specifically in the description of Christ as the good shepherd in the Gospel of John. Due to his mobility and his liminal nature, mediating between opposites, such as merchants and customer, he was considered the god of commerce and social intercourse. The wealth brought in business, especially sudden or unexpected enrichment, travel, roads and crossroads, the changes from the threshold, agreements and contracts, friendship games, the draw, good luck, the sacrifices and the sacrificial animals flocks and shepherds and the fertility of land and cattle. He was also the god of thieves. According to the late Jungian psychotherapist Lopez Pedraza, everything Hermes thieves, he later sacrifices to the gods. Jesus really does represent the sacrificial lamb. In Christianity, Jesus is presented as a crosser of borders, just like Hermes. Hermes Cadesius also reminds us of his role as a healer, something which is reflected in Christ as well. In the Shepherd of Hermes in Parable 5, the author mentions a son of God as a virtuous man filled with a holy pre-existent spirit and adopted as the son. In the second century, adoptionism, the view that Jesus Christ was at least initially only a mortal man, was one of two competing doctrines about Jesus' true nature, the other being that he pre-existed as the word Logos, were only begotten son of God and is to be identified as such from his conception. Christ's identity as the Logos, John 1.1, 1, 1, in which the Logos is further understood to be uncreated and coessentially divine with God, that is, the Father, was affirmed in 325 at the first council of Nicaea. Bogdan Guy Bukur says the document was widely accepted among Orthodox Christians yet was not criticized for apparently exhibiting an adoptionistic Christology. 
He says that the passage in question should be understood as Jesus making his dwelling within those who submit to his spirit, so that the adoption that takes place is not of Jesus, but of his followers. In Christian theology, kenosis is the self-emptying of Jesus' own will and becoming entirely receptive to God's divine will. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Philippians 2.4 The Christa Delphian Tom Barling considered that the emptying of Christ was a continual process which started in the earliest references to Christ's character, Luke 2.40-52, and continued throughout the temptation of Christ and his ministry. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Luke 2.40 Though worship of Hermes had been almost fully suppressed in the Roman Empire following the Christian persecution of paganism under Theosiris I in the 4th century AD, Hermes continued to be recognized as a mystical or prophetic figure, though a mortal one by Christian scholars. Early medieval Christians such as Augustine believed that a ehumorized Hermes Trismegistus had been an ancient pagan prophet who predicted the emergence of Christianity in his writings. Some Christian philosophers in the medieval and renaissance periods believed in the existence of a Prisca Theologia, a single thread of true theology that could be found uniting all religions. Christian philosophers used hermetic writings and other ancient philosophical literature to support their belief in a Prisca Theologia, arguing that Hermes Trismegistus was a contemporary of Moses, or that he was the third in a line of important prophets after Enoch and Noah. The 10th century Suda attempted to further Christianize the figure of Hermes, claiming that he was called Trismegistus on account of his praise of the Trinity, saying there is one divine nature in the Trinity. Hermes was a champion of mankind and was the most human of the gods. Hermes was also a man that became a god. This is mirrored in the kenosis or self-emptying of Jesus and in Enoch's ascension into the angel Metatron. This trickster archetype often pretends to be the idiot, the clown or the king in disguise because they know so much more than those around them. A savior first walks among those they are trying to lead out of Plato's cave, Astrox. In Gnostic tradition, the serpent in the Garden of Eden is conflated with Jesus, and Hermes, or Toth, was often associated with a snake. We also find this in the Sumerian story of Ningsida. Torkild Jakobsen proposed that the Sumerian name Ningsida can be explained as Lord of the Good Tree. There are many, many connections to Jesus here. Ningsida's titles connect him to plants and agriculture. He is frequently mentioned in connection with grass, which he was believed to provide for the sake of domesticated animals. The tree in its name might be wine, according to some Assyriologists, and an association between this god and alcoholic beverages, specifically wine, is well attested. We have long marveled over the amazing pyramids on the Giza Plateau, but it seems we have Toth to thank for them. Build it I, the Great Pyramid. Pattern after the pyramid of earth force, burning eternally so that it, too, might remain throughout the ages. Toth, Emerald Tablet 1 The Great Pyramid's height is in relationship to its base, sides, as circle's radius is to its circumference, and thus it squares the circle. Put another way, the perimeter of the base equals the circumference of a circle, whose radius is equal to the height of the pyramid. This is only achieved due to the slope angle being 51 degrees and 51 minutes, or 51.84 degrees, since there are 60 arc minutes in one degree. I noticed that in the six days it supposedly took to create heaven and earth, there were exactly 518 400 seconds, which resonate with the decade. 
the decimal system and the slope angle. And just recently my friend Dane Herdon pointed out the fact that 5084 also resonates with the canonical value of the precession of the equinoxes of 25,920 years as 25,920 times 2 equals 51,840. Yodubs.com The squaring of the circle is a stage on the way to the unconscious. A point of transition leading to a goal lying as yet unformulated beyond. It is one of the paths to the center. Carl Gustav Jung The highest knowledge is unutterable. For it exists as an entity in lanes which transcend all material words or symbols. All symbols are but keys to doors leading to truth. And many times the door is not opened because the key seems so great that the things which are beyond it are not visible. If we can understand that all keys, all material symbols or manifestations are but extensions of a great law and truth, we will begin to develop the vision which enables us to penetrate beyond the veil. Toth, Emerald Tablet 1 Man's search for understanding of the laws which regulate his life has been unending, yet always just beyond the veil which shields the higher planes from material man's vision, the truth has existed, ready to be assimilated by those who enlarge their vision by turning inward, not outward, in the search in the silence of material senses lies the key to the unveiling of wisdom. He who talks does not know. He who knows does not talk. Toth, Emerald Tablet 1 Custodians and watchers of the force of man's bondage, ready to lose when the light has been reached, first and most mighty sits the veiled presence, Lord of Lords, the infinite nine, over the other from each the lords of the cycles. Tablet 2 Then spoke I, O oh, great master, let me be a teacher of men, leading them onward and upward, until they, too, are lights among men, freed from the veil of the night that surrounds them, flaming with light that shall shine among men. Tablet 2 Mysteries there are in the cosmos that unveiled fill the world with their light. Let he who would be free from the bonds of darkness first divine the material from the immaterial, the fire from the earth. For know ye that as earth descends to earth, so also fire ascends unto fire and becomes one with fire. He who knows the fire that is within himself shall ascend unto the eternal fire and dwell in it eternally. Tablet 3 Know, O man, that light is thine heritage. Know that darkness is only a veil. Sealed in thine heart is brightness eternal, waiting the moment of freedom to conquer, waiting to rend the veil of the night. Tablet 4 Around it they close the veil of their night. There, through its lifetime, that soul dwells in bondage, bound by the feathers of the veil of the night. Mighty are they in the forbidden knowledge, forbidden because it is one with the night. Tablet 6 The Gematria value of veil is 734, and the Gematria value of evil is also 734. For just as the Gnostic said, ignorance is where evil has its origin. And Metatron is the lord of the veil, as I mentioned in my previous video. Ignorance is a slave, knowledge, gnosis is freedom. If we know the truth, we shall find the fruits of the truth within us. If we join it, it will fulfill us. The Gospel of Philip, Nag Hammadi Codex. Graham Hancock, in his interview with Joe Rogan, mentions the squaring of the circle. Let's listen to that. Everybody has heard of uh, Tikal. Mm -hmm. What archaeologists didn't know was that literally within walking distance of Tikal, surrounding that whole area were more than 60,000 structures that they hadn't identified. And these have all been identified by LIDAR in a country that's just 100,000 kilometers in area. So you have to ask yourself, in that five and a half million square kilometers of the Amazon, if LIDAR technology could be applied comprehensively, what would we find beneath there? And the evidence already is extremely tempting and extremely 
tantalizing. And I'm intrigued by these huge geometrical figures, uh, which involve primarily uh, circles and squares. And they are classic hinges in the sense that they are deep ditches surrounded by huge embankments. They're extremely geometrical. For example, you can find an octagon surrounding a square. Uh, at a place called Jacosa in the Amazon, you can find a square perfectly enclosing a circle. Now that is an exercise called squaring the circle that our, our, our academics have given to the Greeks. They said the Greeks were the first person, people who performed that exercise. But now we find in dated sites in the Amazon that this was being done in the Amazon long before the Greeks. What are the dates? Uh, the earliest dates that have been found in these sites now are about three and a half thousand years old about three and a half thousand years old. But the evidence is that the sites have been constantly remade. And what intrigues me is what remains in that five and a half million square kilometers that has not been investigated yet. We are just, I think, looking at the edges of a mystery. The archeologists involved, who are mainly from Finland and also from Brazil, feel the same. Their, their estimate is that there are thousands of these structures remaining in the jungle, and they're open as to how old they may ultimately prove to be. The investigation needs to be done. But what's fascinating about them is this very powerful geometry and astronomy. So a number of the sites are perfectly aligned to true north, true south, true east, and true west. I'm not talking about magnetic north. I'm talking about true astronomical north. To do that, there's only one way to do it, and that's with, uh, with astronomy. So that tells us that astronomers were at work in the Amazon. The geometry is very complex and very precise. That tells us that people with geometrical skills were at work in the Amazon. And thirdly, the scale of the sites of hundreds of meters, gigantic earthworks on the scale of hundreds of meters, uh, tells us that this was highly organized uh, project that was undertaken uh, on a very large scale by very large numbers of people. It's a wonderful mystery and, and it deserves much further, much further attention. And I'm, I'm yeah, that's Jacosa, exactly. The square, wow. squaring the circle. So you can see the, the, the outside embankment and then inside it is the square ditch. And then there's another embankment inside that and a circle and a circle inside that. It's crazy that they made a road right through that. What well, assholes. a modern road, yeah, you know, because because there's no respect for there's no respect yeah. for the ancient for the ancient world, unfortunately. And there's another one. Look at that. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. Now, why would this ancient problem also show up in the Amazon? Who brought this knowledge there? Well, it doesn't take much speculation to figure out that it has something to do with Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. Quetzalcoatl, in its literal sense, means serpent of precious feathers, but in the allegorical sense, wisest of men. Quetzalcoatl was the Aztec god of the sun and wind, air and learning. In the post-classical Nahua civilization of central Mexico, Aztec, the worship of Quetzalcoatl was ubiquitous. Cult worship may have involved the ingestion of hallucinogenic mushrooms, psilocybes considered sacred. The most important center was Cholula, where the world's largest pyramid was dedicated to Quetzalcoatl worship. In Aztec culture, depictions of Quetzalcoatl were fully anthropomorphic. Quetzalcoatl was associated with the wind god, Ehekatl, and is often depicted with his insignia, a beak-like mask. Interesting link to Toth's ibis head. Quetzalcoatl was often considered the god of the morning star. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Revelation 22:16. Then from his throne came one of the masters, taking my hand and leading me onward, through the halls of the deep hidden land. Led he me through the halls of Amenti, showing the mysteries that are known not to man. Through the dark passage, downward he led me, into the hall where sight the dark death. Vast as space lay the great hall before me, walled by darkness, but yet filled with light. Before me arose a great throne of darkness, veiled on it seated a figure of night. Darker than darkness sat the great figure, dark with the darkness not of the night. Before it then passed the master, speaking the word that brings about life, saying, O master of darkness, guide of my way from life unto life. Before thee I bring a son of the morning. Touch him not ever with the power of night. Call not his flame to the darkness of night. Know him and see him, one of our brothers. 
lifted from darkness into the light. Release thou his flame from its bondage. Free let its flame through the darkness of night. Tablet 2, Emerald Tablets Quetzalcoatl was known as the inventor of books and the calendar, the giver of maize, corn to mankind, and sometimes as a symbol of death and resurrection. Quetzalcoatl was also the patron of priests and the title of the twin Aztec high priests. According to the Book of Mormon, the resurrected Jesus Christ descends from heaven and visited the people of the American continent shortly after his resurrection. Some followers of the Latter-day Saints movement believed that Quetzalcoatl was historically Jesus Christ, but believed his name and the details of the event were gradually lost over time. Quetzalcoatl is not a religious symbol in the Latter-day Saint faith and is not taught as such, nor is it in their doctrine that Quetzalcoatl is Jesus. However, in 1892, one president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, John Taylor, wrote, the story of the life of the Mexican divinity Quetzalcoatl closely resembles that of the Savior, so closely indeed, that we can come to no other conclusion that Quetzalcoatl and Christ are the same being. But the history of the former has been handed down through us, through an impure Lamanitish source, which has sadly disfigured and perverted the original incidents and teachings of the Savior's life and ministry. Meditation and Atonement This is where Saturn comes into squaring the circle. The conjunction of opposites, of spirit and matter, of circle and square. Metatron sits at the base of the tree of life and Sandalphon sits at the top. Sandalphon may be derived from the Greek prefix sim sim meaning together and aldephos meaning brother, thus approximately meaning co-brother. Since the modern Greek word for co-worker, Sandalphos, has these roots as seen in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 10. This probably refers to Sandalphon's relationship to Metatron, as above, so below. In Kabbalah, Sandalphon is the angel who represents the Sephira Malkut and overlaps or is confused with the angel of Metatron. This is from the Wikipedia page on Sandalphon. As you can see, the rider has not squared the circle. Jesus' birth is also squaring the circle, the conjunction of male and female, the meeting of Father Heaven and Mother Earth. At Jesus' birth, three wise men were said to have visited him. The three kings, the three stars of Orion, the three pyramids or a mirror image of Orion's belt on earth. The whole Giza pyramid complex is a foretelling of the birth of Christ, the rebirth of Toth. Hermes was born of his godly father Zeus and the nymph Maya, here representing earth. Maria and Maya, there is literally one letter difference. History does not repeat, but it does rhyme. Hermaphrodites, the two-sexed child of Aphrodite and Hermes, Venus and Mercury, had long been a symbol of androgyny or effeminacy and was portrayed in Greek-Roman art as a female figure with male genitals. Theopratus' account suggests a link between Hermaphrodites and the institution of marriage. The reference to the fourth day of the month is telling. This is the luckiest day to have a wedding. Hermaphrodite's association with marriage seems to have been that, by embodying both masculine and feminine qualities, he symbolized the coming together of men and women in sacred union. Another factor linking Hermaphrodite's to weddings was his parents' role in protecting and blessing brides. At neardeath.com, link in the description to a web archive, there's a list of the different incarnations of Jesus according to the famous sleeping prophet Edgar Cayce. And on that list, Enoch is included as one of the incarnations. Now, I don't base my information on the readings of psychics, but I thought it was an interesting thing to note. While researching, I stumbled across Rebecca Diggs, the Hermetic Christ, and I like what I found, so I would like to read some different paragraphs from it. The reader can distinguish a multiplicity of deities in Jesus Christ using the ancient Greek pantheon as an exemplary system of western archetypical metaphors for reference. In his rebellion against the lawmakers and his young violent death, one may recognize Dionysian shape, for example, and in his love for community and his deep wisdom one glimpses Athena. Amidst these typical and more celebrated attributes, however, hides the visage of a trickster, an undeniably hermetic aspect of Jesus' complex character. It is the Hermes in Jesus Christ, the subtle hues and silhouettes the two gods share. 
This is the focus of this essay. Although the young thief god of the ancient Greeks is a notorious charmer, and though many fundamentalist Christians turn a forcefully blind eye to these stricter qualities, so was Jesus. He is also a master of rhetoric, a helper of humankind, and a spiritual guide. So if we allow the young Hermes of the Homeric hymns to escort us to the shadowy places in Jesus Christ mythology for a few moments, we may ultimately be better endowed to celebrate the Messiah's divine genius. The God of Between The story of Hermes begins in the shadows. Stir-crazy and overtaken by desire, Zeus leaves his throne under the cover of night to ravish the beautiful and mysterious earth nymph Maya in the dark cave in which she dwells. Their affair is passionate and secret, a permeation of the dangerous boundaries of duty and class. The king of Olympus, mighty father of the gods, making love to a lowly nymph, a mere servant, a rustic form girl. This penetrable edge on the outskirts of order is the realm in which Hermes is conceived and born. Not quite high god, not quite terrestrial nymph, his very foundation lies with a foot in two different worlds. As a result, his nature is one of in-betweenness, of shadiness and illusion. He is born a misfit. But Hermes, an inventor from his first day, realizing his unbelonging as the windfall that it is. Though he may never fully fit into either the mortal world or the all-powerful pantheon, Hermes is free to participate in the workings of both, to serve as a medium for each. As Godolphin describes him, Hermes is a versatile god, concerned with a variety of activities. Among the Olympians, he's a messenger and an errand boy, but among men, he's a friendly and sociable god. His domain is not limited to the terrestrial or the Olympian. Rather, he is the point of connection between these two worlds. This space between the liminal realm of Hermes is the birthright of Jesus as well, born of divinity and mortality. Jesus is at once the Son of God and the Son of Man, serving as the medium between God the Father and humanity. This dual nature is a mythological culmination of Jesus' conception by a mortal mother of a divine father. As Kereni writes, The beginning and the end of autogony coincide. Begetting and birth are identical, as also the begetter and the begotten. Thus Hermes' conception in a dark and secret cave, far away from radiant Olympus and the knowing eyes of the high gods, imbues his character with its shadiness, its subtle evasiveness, and Jesus' conception imbues his own character with a mysterious and powerful metal. He may be, in a sense, a bastard child, but his very strength lies in his unique blending of human frailty and immortal power, making him God with us. Matthew 1.23 As the Son of God, Jesus is the carrier of God's Spirit and Divine Message. As the Son of Man, He is a teacher and healer amongst men, ultimately able to sacrifice His mortal body and free His Spirit to eternal life as an ultimate lesson on faith. The New Testament writer Alistair McGrath refers to Christ as a mediator between God and humanity at several points, e.g. Hebrews 9.15. 1 Timothy 2.5 Christ here is understood to mediate between a transcendent God and a fallen humanity. Like Hermes, had Jesus been born of either earth or heaven, his role as mediator and messenger would not be possible. When Jesus prayed for his disciples in the Gospel of John, he pled to God that because they had accepted his word and were therefore hated in the world, they, like Jesus himself, were not of the world and thus might be saved. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of this world any more than I am of this world. John 17, 14 Jesus' deeds, however, are worldly deeds, because he is a man. His feet walk the dusty ground. His community is a human one. His pedagogy teems with rich earthly images. Though his nature is divine, his works are terrestrial. And as McGorth asserts, There is a close link between the Christian understanding of the person of Christ and the work of Christ. His ministry on the streets and in the slums is elemental to the power of his character. He is a God who likes to get his hands dirty. Like Hermes, Jesus Christ is a God in the world, not above it. He interacts with his surroundings and experiences them, 
hands on rather than lingering in the clouds in heaven or atop Mount Olympus, merely observing and speculating. As his mythos reminds us, Hermes is the god of liminality, a god with one foot on Olympus and one in the underworld, and indeed one foot between these poles, stirring the dust of the earth. Stated succinctly by Christine Downing, every threshold is Hermes, the god of the crossroads, the doorway, and the messy terrain between underworld and upper world. Hermes finds a brother in the god of the cross, of the ethereal, of the transcendent power of God born into the human world, Jesus Christ. Jesus and Hermes represents epiphany, needed epiphany, amidst their static, established cultures. Their births bring about a renovation and reinvention of the world. As Kereni describes, the gods are so original that a new world is always born with a new god, a new epoch or a new aspect of the world. In Hermes' world, erupts a power to subtly undermine all powers. A charmer who can penetrate golden Apollo's walls and a muse, here therefore unchallenged suits, into soft acquaintance. Into Jesus' world is born a similar such divine child, a trickster who subverts the power that be from the day of his advent and who presents his people with a wholly new avenue to spiritual communion. The epiphanic nature of these divinities' appearances is reinforced by the fact that their stories begin at birth and infancy. Says Kerini, where one divinity appears among others as a shell, it means that epiphany occupies the central place. In other words, the god who erupts suddenly onto the scene as a divine child is consistently of central importance, is soon to be psychopomp like Hermes or someday savior like Jesus Christ. By focusing on his infancy, stories of Hermes not only foreshadows his destiny as a bonfire god, but also emphasizes his relationship to Zeus, the father. In the Homeric hymn which tells us his story, Hermes is largely motivated for his midnight cattle ride by a desire to earn recognition and honor for his lowly mother and himself. As a part of the dysfunctional family of Zeus, ultimately what legitimizes him and truly all the Olympians' gods is his connection to Zeus, the high god's recognition that Hermes is his son and has displayed some commendable, even enviable traits. Similarly, Jesus' relationship to God is the source of his legitimacy as the Christ. As McGrath argues, the New Testament differentiates between Jesus as the Son of God and believers as adopted children of God. At every level in the New Testament, in the words of Jesus himself, or the impression which was created among the first Christians, Jesus is clearly understood to have a unique and intimate relationship with God, where other prophets have been visited by God, touched in their dreams and moments of meditation. Jesus unshines them as the ultimate prophet, the one son of God. He does not become a conduit to God. As a child of the divine, he is the conduit to God. Being children of God, though not the child of God like Christ, is a vital aspect of the proper religious attitude for Christian followers. To assume childlike nature means, by innocent and open, the state favored by Jesus Christ, as well as his wide-eyed mythological brother Hermes. Jesus teaches his follower throughout his ministry that God's truth shall be revealed only to the innocent, not the hardened and wise. In Jesus' words, according to Matthew, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Matthew 18.3 Many Christians have made a cult out of innocence, literalizing this notion of turning a childlike face to the world. But if one can see the complete picture of the divine child in Christ, one may see both sides of this hermetic archetype, the cunning, the manipulation, the shadiness, as well as the wonder, the openness, and the innocence. For after all, Hermes' greatest deed on his first day of life is the theft of his brother Apollo's precious cattle. Jesus Christ is undeniably a thief as well, having whisked away a substantial flock of followers from the guarded pasture of Israel and of Rome. Though Christ's innocence seems lordly genuine, 
It is as much an element of his complex rhetorical prowess. Master of Rhetoric When Hermes returns to the safety of his blankets after his first busy day stealing and sacrificing Apollo's cattle, he relaxes, confident that he will not be found out for his trickery. As it may be expected, Apollo is not so pleased with his baby brother's heist. Realizing the culprit of his missing cattle, he charges into Hermes' home and dangles the baby god before his great face, threatening to expel him to dark Tartarus if he refuses to admit to the crime. When Hermes laughingly refuses to yield in the face of such an adamant demand for truth, Apollo demands a hearing in the court of Zeus to bring him to justice. As the brothers stand before mighty Zeus, however, Hermes' silver tongue goes to work, spinning a tale so fantastic and persuasively sweet that his father cannot help but admire the boy and reward this unique power of rhetoric, rather than punishing him for the stolen cattle. Despite the weightly evidence against him, Hermes, realizing this rhetorical facility, insists to Zeus that which is probable is true, and the fact is simply absurd. A baby, just newborn, who could walk right in the door with a herd of cows. What you're talking about is ridiculous. I was born yesterday. Homeric hymns, 37. It doesn't matter what actually happened. Logic says Hermes is just a baby, and any story about him executing such grand feats as the notorious Calorade is absurd. And Zeus the father and even furious Apollo are so taken by his master of rhetoric that little Hermes, downplaying his truly immense power, charms his way into the pantheon before anyone is able to stop him. While Hermes is the god of words, Jesus Christ is the word made flesh. Like Hermes, Jesus is quote no small verbal master, Caputo 43, and like Hermes, some of the facets of Jesus' verbal mastery are the manipulation of political power structures and of people's perception of truth. As he declares in the early days of his ministry, I do not come to abolish the law of the prophets. Matthew 5.17 Indeed, Jesus' rhetorical power is not colored by aggressive confrontation or head-to-head -head battle against the established laws of his society. Rather, he infiltrates society and undermines the overpowered rulers using sermons and parables, subtle words and images. He taught as one with authority, not as their teachers of the law, says Matthew of Christ's compelling pedagogy. Matthew 7.29 His authority comes not from Zeus-like overt brawn, but from hermetic sleight of hand. As young Caput writes in his postmodernist look at the Christian tradition, Quote, the divinity they show through Jesus consists not in a demonstration of might, but in a complete reversal of our expectations. A low-class carpenter, a mere man, is the last threat to establish society that the heads of state expected. Yet, like little baby Hermes, Jesus Christ slips in and calmly and boldly changes everything. In much the same way Hermes downplays his divine might to avoid the wrath of Apollo and Zeus. Jesus too insists that his power is to be kept secret until the appropriate time. As McGrath explains, Jesus does not appear to have been prepared to accept the title Messiah in the course of his ministry. When Peter acclaims Jesus as Messiah, you are the Christ, Jesus immediately tells him to keep quiet about it. Mark 8.29 It is not clear what the full significance of the messianic secret is, yet if this messianic secret is a similar rhetorical device to baby Hermes' denial of his great powers, then Jesus was making a deliberate and strategic move to avoid the consequences of his fate until the time foretold him. An effective move indeed. This rhetorical maneuver transforms Jesus' persecutor's aggression from an act of spiteful murder into a carefully planned moment of divine fate. Though his mortal body is slain, Jesus' godly strength triumphs. Return from the Underworld As a means of managing Hermes' newly realized capacity for mayhem, Zeus assigns him a role, a place in the Pantheon where his swift feet and gift for communication can be assets rather than tools of the destruction. The young trickster is named the messenger of the gods, the giver of gifts, and overseer of transactions among humans. A seer of prophecy, and the one and only liaison between Hades and those who dwell in the upper levels of the world. 
These are the, the titles which distinguish the adult Hermes from the newborn Hermes, granting him the characteristics which he is best known, a messenger of the gods. He is present in all moments of rhetoric and communication, and from his meetings with Hades, god of the underworld. Hermes brings the surface pure and powerful treasure from this subterrain, truth that dwells only in the depths. Christine Downing describes the relationship as a unique combined effort. Hades pulls down to the underworld and Hermes leads back up. While all souls are someday stolen away to the underworld, Hermes is one of only two who are allowed to ascend again to earth and even up to the heights of Olympus. And when he arises, he brings with him valuable wisdom and deep essential power, gifts from the underworld. Among the miracles Jesus Christ performed which distinguished him as a god on earth, his resurrection from the grave after three days of burial is to many the most spectacular. During his three days in the tomb, Jesus dwells in the underworld, his soul ripening and his spirit being lightened of his fleshly fetters. And when he finally ascends to join his father in heaven, he brings to the sacred heights a unique wisdom which was earned in the world and in the underworld. This is not the first time in Jesus' life such an underworld journey imbued him with sacred wisdom. As Crossan describes Jesus' childhood escape from Herod to Egypt, as told in the book of Matthew, it is pagan wisdom from abroad, not civil power at home, that accepts and worships newborn Jesus. If pagan Egypt represents a metaphorical underworld, then it follows that Jesus is accepted even in his infancy by the underworld. And as such, acceptance makes him all the stronger and wiser for his faithful journey to the cross and beyond. Jesus' journey to and from the underworld is thus not simply an escape from or rejection of the dark recesses of the world. Rather, it represents his embrace of those shadowy areas, a willingness to be contaminated by the taboo mysteries of death and decay for the sake of completeness. By opening himself to the underworld's wisdom, the Christ character becomes deepened and more complex, more whole than he could have been had he dwelled only on earth or in the heavens. In his return from the darkness, he brings knowledge of the realms beyond flesh that proves his dominion over not only the dusty earth and the pure transcendent heaven, but the strange shadiness of death as well. Perhaps most vital among the treasure Jesus delivers after his underworld trek is his embodiment of the other independence of death and birth, womb and tomb. As Jung argues of the divine child, just as the child is in certain circumstances closely related to the phallus, symbol of the begetter, so it comes up again in the sepulchral phallus, a symbol of renewed begetting. Without his death and entombment, Jesus could not have been reborn, resurrected in a form pure and whole. That he belongs equally to the underworld as to earth or the heavens shows Jesus' divinity, his kind of purity, emanates from his wholeness, not only from negating death or transcending the terrestrial realm. Just as Hermes reminds us on his daily wanderings across the lowest and highest planes of a being, Jesus Christ reminds us that the cradle and the grave are intimately and eternally related, that life itself, as well as all that life symbolizes, Growth, perseverance, renewal depends upon death, decay, darkness, end of reading from Hermetic Christ. C.G. Young, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Toth is depicted as an ibis because an ibis gets substance by digging its beak deep into the darkness of the earth and bringing the fruit up to the light. The lotus flower represents one symbol of fortune in Buddhism. It grows in muddy water. And it is this environment that gives forth the flower's first and most literal meaning, rising and blooming above the murk to achieve enlightenment. The second meaning, which is related to the first, is purification. It resembles the purifying of the spirit which is born into murkiness. The mud represents an importance in the meaning of the lotus flower in Buddhism. All humans are born in a world where there is suffering. This suffering is a vital part of the human experience. It makes us stronger and teaches us to resist the temptation of evil. When we banish evil through our minds, we are also able to break free of the muddy water and become one with the Buddha. The mud shows us who we are and teaches us to choose the right path over the easy one. Finally, the lotus flower represents rebirth, 
both in a figuratively and literal sense. The rebirth can be a change of ideals, an acceptance of Buddha where there was once none, the dawn after one's darkest day, a renaissance of beliefs or the ability to see past wrongs. In a literal sense, the meaning of the lotus flower in Buddhism represents rebirth as a reincarnation, such as in the Buddhist religion, when a soul leaves this world in its present form to be reborn into another. In Luke 22.10, Jesus speaks of his return. He answered, When you enter the city, a man carrying a jug of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. A man carrying a jug of water is Aquarius, and we have currently entered the age of Aquarius. Hermes was the god of thieves, and in 1 Telosians 5.2, Jesus speaks about his return. For you are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. John 14.28 But in a time yet unborn will I rise again, mighty and potent, requiring an accounting of those left behind me. Toth, Emerald Tablets Thank you all for watching. Give it a like if you feel so inclined, and let me know what you think in the comments below. See you next time, mortal. Remember to hit that bell button to stay notified. Subscribe for more red pill content. Do give it a like if you enjoyed it, and feel free to share it. If you want to support my work, you can find me on Patreon at Library of Gnosis. You can find me on YouTube, Facebook, and BitChute at Library of Gnosis. The audio versions of my broadcasts are available on Spotify as a podcast at Library of Gnosis. Music is produced by Coda.